I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 27. Today is Father's Day and it's a day uh, in which we uh, want to honor fathers and I want to talk today to dads, not to, to beat up the dads like so often seems to me happens. I want to encourage fathers and mothers and I want to talk to all of us about ways in which we can bless children and grandchildren, some sp four specific ways we can bless them because you know, one of our responsibilities is to be a blessing to the next generations so that they might come to know God and, and fulfill the purpose God has for their life. So if you found Genesis 27, I invite you to stand with me if you're able for the reading of God's Word and we will... Uh, Ask the Lord to speak to our hearts. So, Father, we come before you now, and in the name of your Son, Jesus, we uh, hold in our hands your precious word, the Bible. We accept it, we believe it, but we need to hear it and understand it, and then we need your power to apply it in our life. So, the things we read today, I pray we'll hear your voice, and you will help us to understand and empower us to obey your word. So we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to begin uh, Genesis 27 at verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass when Isaac was old, and his eyes were so dim that he could not see, that he called Esau his older son, and said to him, My son, and he answered him, Here I am. Then he said, Behold, now I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and make me savory food, such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. And then we go over to uh, verse 22. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him. The word there means he felt or touched him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him. Then he said, Are you really my son Esau? And he said, I am. He said, bring it near to me and I will eat in my son's game so that my soul may bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him and he smelled the smell of his clothing and blessed him and said, surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore, may God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Let peoples serve you, and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curse, curses you, and blessed be those who bless you. You may be seated. Interesting. You all know the story, I hope, that actually Esau and Jacob are twin brothers. So when he said, my oldest son, uh, <laughs> it's uh, one was born before the other. But the interesting thing is when Esau was born, out came Jacob's hand and he grabbed Esau's heel. And uh, so their names, uh, their initial names were related to this incident. Esau means uh, hair or hairy in, in Hebrew because he was a hairy kid and he had reddish color, really red colored hair. And uh, Jacob, his name means two words combined, heel and grasp, like he was grasping the heel. So they named him Heel Grower and that was the name. And so one was born and then the other was born and uh, they were twins, but one had to be born, of course, before the other. And uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about fatherhood. Fatherhood has changed over the years. One father was asked 
who is in charge at his home? And he answered, he said, well, my wife bosses the children, and my children boss the dog, and I can say anything I want to to the goldfish. <laughs> and I thought, unfortunately, things have changed in homes today. It used to be that the father was responsible as the head of the home. In other words, the responsibility for decisions would come to him. I often talk to couples, and when I talk about premarital counseling, I always say, you know, in your relationship, God created us male and female, and in both of us, we have great worth and great value and purpose for God's purpose. And uh, in Ephesians 5, it talks about how we're supposed to put one another before the other and uh, submit ourselves one to the other. It's not that one is higher in God's value than the other. That's not the point. The point is that God has given the responsibility to the man to take responsibility for decisions. That doesn't mean he doesn't share those decisions with his wife, but when they make a decision, he takes the responsibility for it. He doesn't blame his wife for the decision that, that they came to or that he came to. And if a man loves his wife, then there won't be a problem of his wife respecting him and wanting to do the things that they agreed to. But the husband and the wife need to submit to one another. Well, when you come to Father's Day, uh, we're coming to this time in our culture where not always does a man who's a believer and a woman who's a believer come together in Christ and get married and commit a vow before God and witnesses and stay married together. And this has created a lot of problems in our culture. It's, uh, uh, it is a fact that obedience to the will and the word of God will prevent a lot of problems in our society and in our nation and save a ton of money. Uh, and if, if men and women would only marry another believer and remain married for the rest of their life and would respect one another and build up one another and uh, do all the things that God has instructed for us, it's, it would be an easier life. But you and I know, men and women both are not perfect and there are times in our life where people don't get along with one another and they don't always respect one another the way a man should respect his wife or a woman should respect her husband and that does cause a lot of problems. And today we're talking about how to be a blessing to our children and uh, God is the one who gives each child to us. That's another thing in our society today. We've kind of gotten away from the concept that God is our creator. And he's created us, male and female, and designed for a man to leave his father and mother and be married to his wife and to be super glued together for the rest of their life. And when we get away from that, you know and I know, if you be honest about it, it's not easy. It's very painful in life when people don't love each other and fulfill their commitments. And God is the one who gives each of these children to us. And when they're babies, I remember when our children were all babies, they all looked to us with absolute trust. If I said to a child to jump off the counter and jump into my arms, the child never wondered, was I gonna be there to catch them? They, they just would jump and you'd catch them because they trusted their father and their mother and the father and the mother would be there for them. I mean, I can remember when Andy and I, Carrie was a little baby and we had a new baby in the house and it kind of struck us, we can't hear her breathing. She was breathing, she just didn't, wasn't going, <laughs> or whatever. So we were, you know, I remember this, I mean, we tipped down to her room and went to listen and say, is she breathing? You know how you love your children so much and you're so concerned about every little thing about their life. You know, you you boil the, the nipples on their bottles and you, you scrub them all and you boil them all to sterilize them. And that's for the first child. <laughs> and then for the next child, you, uh, you wash them out in hot water and drain and dry and air dry them so they're clean. And you say, I don't really need to be boiling these things. And you just quit boiling them. And by the third child, you just kind of rinse them out in the cold water and <laughs> fill them again. And, if they, and the fourth child is like, if it's only half empty, you just fill it. <laughs> Your sense of 
what is so absolutely critical with that first baby kind of gets a little bit less critical as you go along. I don't know, how many of you have more than four children? Oh, my God. How many, Joe? Five? Seven? How many? Seven? I don't even want to ask. And how many? Nine? The poor ninth kid. I don't know. I mean, like, you tell the older one to go get the bottle for the younger one by the time you get to the ninth one. But anyway, in Genesis 27, it's got this wonderful story about a family. And it's got Isaac, and it's got Jacob and Esau, the twin boys. And when Isaac and Rebekah had these twin boys, they were really different. And I'm sure if you have children, and several, if you've got nine, I don't have to convince you, each child is different. They're not the same. I mean, one of them, you might just look at them with a frown, and they're so sorry they didn't please you, and they come and they want to please you. The next one, when they frown, they go, well, you know, you're going to frown at me, I'll frown at you. And the third one just mouths off at you. I mean, it's like, it's like they're not the same. And we're trying to figure out how to bless our children when they're not all the same. So you can't necessarily just think, well, if I get them all the same thing, they're going to like it. Or the same discipline doesn't work for each one. But when Isaac got old, and that's what the passage said, it says, uh, when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim and he couldn't see like he used to, uh, he realized the end of his days was coming. And when the end of his days was coming, he wanted to bless his favorite son. And I want to speak a little bit about that, to be careful that we don't have favorites. All of my children are my favorite. In other words, they're all different. They're not the same. But they're all special to me. And they're all favorite to me. And I love all of my children. And I'm telling you, if you've ever been in a home where all the children weren't treated equally, I don't have to convince you how painful that is. That hurts. It hurts when one child is favored and another isn't. And that's wrong. Do I have to convince you about that? That's just wrong. They're all different, and they may, they may not all respond the same, but they're all precious because they're created by God. And they're given and trusted to us to be cared for them. So when Isaac's getting older, he's thinking about blessing one of his kids, especially because in those families, which mom and dad are still married, and they're all still living together, and the dad's going to die, and when he dies, he needs somebody to be responsible to take care of his wife. And he needs somebody to kind of keep things uh, organized within the family. Depends how old the dad is when he dies, but when the dad dies, and a lot of times dads die first, and when dad dies first, he wants to have mom taken care of, and he wants the siblings all to be kind of kept in order, and somebody to take over the farm or whatever they've got, the herds. And so he would appoint the oldest one, usually the oldest one, tends to be the more experienced and the more mature one. So it kind of makes sense to bless the oldest one. And the oldest one would be a transfer of authority from dad to the most responsible child. That was the idea. And that the older child then would have a double blessing because uh, of the inheritance because they're responsible to take care of mom and the, and the farm and the, and the animals and they're responsible and so they need more to do that. So... There was a reason for all of it, the way it was done. And the Jewish father's blessing was a very formal thing, and it was the delegation of his leadership and responsibility to the most responsible, which would be the oldest, most experienced child, hopefully. And that's why it says that. And then when, when he does this, Esau takes off, because he said, here's your danger. Remember last week I said, if you start focusing on material things, you will never be satisfied. Material possessions will never satisfy your soul. And so somehow Isaac has gotten this thing, I like to eat, but food is not more important to me than you, and food is not more important to me than any of our children. People are more important to me than anything else. 
I mean, I enjoy, like you, I enjoy having a good meal or whatever, but that's not my most important thing in life. But he was focused on getting his special meal prepared. So Esau takes off to go get the special food. And while he does this, Rebecca hears about it, his wife. And her favorite son is Jacob. Now, to precede this whole talk, Esau had been out in the field, in the, read the chapter before, and while he was out in the field, he came back and he was famished. He was hungry, he was thirsty, whatever. And he said he would trade whatever he had for something to eat. And Jacob goes, really? Well, how about your birthright? How about I take your birthright, but I'll fix you a really good meal. And Esau's like, well, I'm hungry. Sounds like a deal to me. Be careful that you don't raise your kids or grandkids to be more focused on material, what they can get than they are on their responsibilities and on the value of one another. More important. Anyway, Esau comes back and he trades to his brother the birthright and God hears that and he says, really you disrespect me that much that you would give up your birthright and the responsibility as the head of the family of Isaac? You would trade that off for a bowl of beans? That's what he did. And so actually God is the one that made the decision and had told Rebecca that her that the oldest would serve the younger. So God made the decision, but now Rebecca acts on it and she sees this as an opportunity and she gets she fixes a meal, which is the kind of food that uh, that uh, he really likes and uh, that that, that uh, Isaac likes, and she prepares this meal, and she even gets goat fur or whatever wool and puts it on his hands and on his arms, so that when Daddy feels the arms and the hands, he'll say, oh, that must be Esau, the hairy one, the man's man, the hunter, and so he thinks it's Esau, but it's really Jacob, and so he blesses him in that passage. In fact, the way he said it is, he said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he didn't recognize them because his hands were hairy. And Isaac was a little suspicious, but he bought the scheme and passed on the blessing to Jacob. So that's how he got the blessing. These kind of things in families can cause a lot of trouble. If we have favoritism with kids, it can hurt a child until they're old. It can hurt a child if they're not loved equally to every other child. And it's really terrible if we don't love each and every one of our children, not only equally, even if they're different, but give each one the value that they deserve. And I believe that with all my heart. Four essential ways to bless our children. The first one is a meaningful touch. In the, my New King James, it says he felt him, but the word there is to feel him or to touch him. And this meant a lot when I read that. I thought, what we need to do for our children is to give them a meaningful touch. I'm not talking about anything inappropriate. I'm talking about when a child is a baby and they can't talk yet, what do you do to show them you love them? You pick them up, you hold them, you rock them, you hug them, you feed them, you take care of them, you protect them. And a lot of that involves a physical touching, holding, carrying. I think my back still hurts from Carrie coming up to me and going, carry me, carry me. I said, you are Carrie. That was her nickname. And, uh, but maybe it was a good nickname, maybe, because that's what she said all the time, carry me. <laughs> and I used to carry her, but she wanted Daddy to pick her up and carry her, which I did until I couldn't anymore. And, uh, and uh, that's the way it was going. And so Isaac touched his child. And I think that was probably a normal thing for Isaac to touch his children, to hug them. And when it talks about a kiss in there, come near and kiss me. In the Middle East, when they kiss, it's not any weirdness like you see on TV. We're talking about, we're talking about a son or a brother or a friend that comes up to you. And when you greet each other, you get a manly bear hug and you get a kiss on the cheek. You know how they do that? They kiss on the cheek. There's nothing sexual about this. It's just a 
greeting, the way they greeted each other, with a big acceptance. That meant, I accept you, and, uh, and I embrace you as my brother, or my friend, or my son. And, uh, and so that's the way they would do that, a big, a big old hug. And Jacob was 40 year, about 40 years old when Isaac touched and kissed him. And so this was no, like, no weirdness here. This was just an acceptance and a brotherly love kind of a thing. It was also traditional when a blessing was given that there would be this formal embracing and the kisses on the cheek and then the father would speak a blessing upon his son. It was a very formal and very important occasion between them. So the first thing that's so important to let your kids know or grandchildren know is to hug them. I mean, what do we do in Baptist churches? The first thing we do if we accept somebody is we reach out and we shake their hand. You know, we shake their hand. Or we may have a hug or something. And uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing we do is to speak to them and tell them we love them. And I, and I like the way he said it. He said he came near and, and kissed him. He gave him a hug and kissed him. And he smelled the smell of his clothing and he blessed him and he said, Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field. And I was thinking, how many kids today would like it? He said, you smell like the field. You know, what he's talking about. Any farmers in here? Have you ever been near a farm or on a farm when it's ready to harvest? There is this smell of the grain and the, or the produce if it's a, if it's a, a fruit orchard. And there's the smell of what you're going to harvest. And it smells good. It's wholesome. It's like this rich smell of the grain or the fruit or the produce of the land. And that what he's meaning is not you smell like dirt. What he means is you smell really good because God blessed us with the grain or the fruit and the sun and the water and the soil. And that's a good thing when you say you smell like a harvest. Because what is a child? The harvest of your life, the fruit of your life. So he's making a good thing. It's not a, he's not calling, you smell like dirt. That's what it looks like, you smell like a field. <laughs> if you're not a farmer, you wouldn't understand that. Anyway, Isaac was an old outdoorsman. He was, really loved his son and he wanted him to know it and he said that to him. Too many times today what happens instead of saying, you really look good to me, or it's good to see you, or you, you really smell good, or whatever. <laughs> People say things to their children like, dummy, why'd you spill the milk? Or you're lazy, you'll never amount to anything. You're too fat. You need to lose some weight. When you lose some weight, then I'll talk to you. And you know what happens when all you can think of is what's wrong with your children? And you criticize them for every mistake they make, everything you don't like about them, their appearance. Do you know what happens to that child? Their self-worth, their worth as a human being created by the image of God goes down. Because they begin to believe or get hurt by the words we say. And when you say things that aren't loving and kind to your children, that I love you and there's... Nothing that I'll ever change. I don't like the way you just spoke to your mother and you need to go apologize for that, but I do love you. And because I love you, I'm not going to allow you to misbehave. That's different. But to criticize a person for the way they look or say to them things like, you'll never amount to anything, you're, you're worthless, you're no good, I'm sorry I ever had you, you were a mistake. Those are things that are just devastating to a person and will carry with them the rest of their life. You all follow what I'm saying? We need to be very careful how we act toward one another and especially young people and we need to be careful what we say to them because people need seven times more words of encouragement they need one word of criticism. Now did I mean that you should never point out when a child is wrong? No, I didn't say that. Sometimes you need to confront a child or a person and say, hey, you shouldn't have spoken like that. Or well, you said you were going to take the trash out, but you didn't, and now the truck came and we missed the trash. Or 
Sometimes we need to speak to our child, but we should always phrase it in the context of because I love you and because I want you to be successful and I want you to fulfill the purpose God has for you, you're better than that. So the next time I know you'll take the trash out, right? Or what? do the dishes or... For me, it's mop the floor. <laughs> I get to mop the floor. But you know mopping the floor or taking out the trash can be an act of love, can it? It can be a way of saying, I want to take care of you and I want to be responsible and those things can be good. So, <laughs> did I hit a nerve there? Somebody hit a nerve in the back. <laughs> what I really worry about is when I see the wife go boom, like that, and I can even listen to this. And so we need to be careful about criticizing because people really hear the criticism and, and they don't remember all the kind things you say to them unless it's more common to say affirmation and encouragement. God is a perfect parent and I want to share with you what I believe is probably a word of encouragement from God because this is the word of God that says, God so loved the world. Does that say he loves you? Yes. Now, if God loves you and somebody else doesn't, who's right? I hope you're all listening to me right now. If someone else says they don't love you, but God says, I love you, and I sent my son to die for you, God's right. Listen to him. You can believe what he says. For he gave what? His only begotten son, that whoever, and by the way, that whoever or whosoever, means you. It means you. It means God loves you. And if you believe in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, then even when your appointed time comes to leave this life and you die, then you won't really perish, but you'll have the rest of your eternal life, everlasting life. So I want you to be careful who you listen to. And if you listen to this word from God, it's a word that says you're valuable to God regardless of what anybody else said. You need to be, listen to God. Be careful. You need to know God loves you. That He loves you enough to give His own Son for you. That says something about your value. He doesn't just love you. He values you. And He has a great future for you because His future is everlasting life in the presence of God. Third thing we need to do in addition to giving our kids hugs and doing things with them and going for walks with them and things like that and in addition to saying that we love them and letting them know what we look forward to in their life is to assure them of their value. Children a lot of times don't know they're important or valuable to you unless we show it or say it. So when he said, may God give you the dew of heaven of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine, what he was saying is you're special. And God is going to bless you. And God is going to prosper you so that you're able to enjoy a good life, a good future life in your life. And so what God is saying is He's saying you're important. And if you're important to God, listen to me, if you're important to God and He values you so much that He would give His Son for you, but somebody else says you're not worth very much, who's telling you the truth? God is. Who demonstrated it? What more could God possibly do to demonstrate that you're important and valuable to Him and that He loves you and has good purpose for you than God when He gave His Son for you? Is there anything more God could give to you that would, that would prove how much He loves you? No. The one thing that God did that says to me, no matter what anybody else says and what they do or don't do, that says I'm worth something to God is that He gave His Son for me. And He gave His Son for you if you're a believer. This means regardless of what anybody else ever said to you, or did, or failed to do, or promises they broke, many of those were broken to me when I was growing up as a kid. It caused me to have great difficulty trusting people because I didn't believe what they said until they actually did it. <laughs> I'm kind of over that now. I've grown up some. But you know, that really hurt me in my younger life. A lot. And then when God says, I love you and gave his son for us, and he said, may you have all these things, and basically may God meet all your needs. 
How do you show that to a child today? Not just by words. When a child comes up and wants to talk to you, we need to stop what we're doing and listen. How many times have I failed when I was busy to not stop and drop whatever I'm doing and turn around and pay attention to my child? And I can't take those moments back. I don't think I'm the only one in this room who was ever busy when a child walked up and you said, I'm busy right now, I'll talk to you later. And later might not come. They're going to come back a few times and after a few years of that, they're going to say, I'm not trying anymore. Not trying anymore. And I want to tell you, you, you wish you could change that. So turn off the radio, turn off the TV, lay down the newspaper, stop doing what you're doing. The best thing is to say, I'm so glad you came up to see me. I was working on this, but I'd rather listen to you right now. And then when you really need to get back to doing it, you might say, hey, why don't, let, why don't we do this together? They don't know how to do it yet. You're going to have to show them. But you say, let's do it together and you spend time with them. Fourth thing, affirm the value of the child. Let them know about their future. What a person is isn't just what they have been or the mistakes they've made in the past because we've all made mistakes. We all have things we've either done or things that we should have done and we didn't do in the past. Don't live there. Go forward. And so you tell children, you have a great future. God created you. You have great worth to God. God loves you and I love you. God has, a, he's going to prosper you and the things that you do in your life. When you're obeying God, he will bless you and make you prosper in your life. And furthermore, you have a great future. And if you continue to put God first and other people before yourself, it will come back to you. Someday, if you continue to put God first and others before yourself, God sees that. And you cannot outgive God. And God will bless you and provide for you and protect you and lead you and give you wisdom you wouldn't have had otherwise. If God knows he can trust you, then he will entrust you with more. And your future will be greater than your past. What I'm saying to you today, it's so important. I hope you're listening to what I have to say today. No matter what your past has been, friend, you've got to stop living your whole life like this. Looking back. You know, I'm, I'm going to look back all the time. I'm like, oh, my past was, my past was so bad. I, you know, a, a crunch. This is what we do. How many of us live our whole life looking in the rearview mirror saying, this is what happened to me in my past and I'm so angry and bitter and hurt by that. But I want to say, stop looking backwards and start looking up to Christ. He loves you. He will never make a promise to you that He doesn't keep. He always keeps His promise. He's made promises for you and for me that He will always fulfill. Always. Trust Him and look to Him and look forward in your life to what He has for you. And so when He says, let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be those who bless you. Man, He spoke a promise. It's like, you have this great future ahead of you. You haven't received it yet, but this is what it is. You know what people begin to live like? Who they believe they are. If a child knows they're a child of the king, then we start acting more like a child of the king. If I know I'm a child of God, I start acting like a prince. And if I were a lady, I'd act like a princess, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm a dude, so I'm going to act like a prince. I'm a child of the king. You just turn to somebody here and say, if they're a lady, say you're a princess. If they're a guy, say you're a prince. Child of the king. That's gender neutral. Child of the king. <laughs> you look at Proverbs 22, 6, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, that's most of us, he won't depart from it. 
that's what we need to do, is to tell children the ways that they should behave in a way that's obedient to God and trusts God and shows God that they love Him, because that's how you show God you love Him, is obeying Him. And the spiritual application of this is to teach them the things of God, and when they're old, they won't forsake the things of God. So help a child to discover who they are, your creation of God. God values you. If no one else had a kind word to say to you or valued you, God does. Who's right? If God values you enough to give His Son, but everybody else said you're not worth anything, who's telling you the truth? God is. Please learn to listen to God and stop looking back and remembering all the old tapes and records from the past. Because if you listen to all that stuff, you'll be so depressed and angry and down. And I say, knock it off. It's time to put that behind you and look up and go forward in your life.